Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. And this is the first time ever that I participated in a presidential lecture series. And so I'm naturally nervous and I hope you will uh, be, uh, you know, I will be humble <laughs> with what I know and don't know. And I hope you will help to supplement the pieces of the story that I'm sure many of you in the audience um, have studied and have experienced with in ways that I do not. Now, um, again, I think it's very visionary to convene a lecture series on the topic of technology and the human future because that's a crucial, uh, a, a crucial concept for us or two, two sets of concepts for us to be thinking in relation with. And I also recognize that the series uh, is not only inviting new conversation at the American University of Paris on this topic, but is already a, a celebration of existing solid accomplishments and in the classroom work uh, to teach about technology and the human. Uh, in, in large part, thanks to the leadership of Claudio Roda and Susan Perry and their work on the master's program, Data Science and Human Rights. So I want to thank also Claudia and Susan for their leadership, which serves as a role model for the kinds of things I hope to, to, to do at, at uh, the, you know, the institutes that I will continue working in in the future for your scholarship on the areas uh, that are crucial to this specific lecture and for your friendship. May it produce many more, uh, many more, uh, you know, conversations and, and projects together. So on um, the minds of many of us, us, I'm sure right now is the war in Ukraine. And it preoccupies me so much that I find it um, necessary to rethink my academic projects uh, in light of what, uh, of what is going on. And although I don't pretend that the current project in any way directly speaks to what's going on in Ukraine or uh, kind of addresses, addresses that or can in any way help to lessen the suffering that is taking place uh, now so near to us. Um, I have been thinking about the way in which the lecture for today kind of connects to some things that I'm seeing emerging from the conflict. And I want to briefly mention two of them before I start the actual lecture. The first is that I think that I would be curious to speak with you in discussion about this later. Um, it's certainly core to our topic of technology in the human future. But the first, the first point is the way in which the war in Ukraine has really thrust thinking about history into, uh, into our lives. Um, we are con con continuously, and if, uh, uh, you know, you know, daily reporting about the, the war, we're hearing about the long arc of the 20th century from the formation of the Soviet Union um, and the significance of that, <laughs> that formation for the way the order or Europe, you know, Europe and, and the world should look in the present to discussions of concepts like genocide or the Nazi regime um, to the 1980s and 1990s and the fall of the Soviet Union, the creation of independent new republics. So this kind of thrusting of, of, of history and of the narratives of alternative, really alternative and sometimes older and sometimes almost feel like, uh, you know, um, past uh, narratives of what, uh, what identity means, what sovereignty means, I think it's really, really a, a way, awakening uh, for people like myself who frequently are so focused on the present and on the future. When we study ethics of technology so frequently, we forget about the past. Not only because our subject matter is about the new, the innovation, uh, the emergent, but also because of the way in which our relationship with technologies, especially digital technologies, have, have come to contribute to certain attitudes towards time and temporality that I believe really erase certain other ways of thinking about the past that, again, we see to be really core, core uh, in, in this war. And so um, my project uh, that I would like to discuss with you today is really uh, trying to recover a sense of the past significance for our present day relationship between humans and digital technologies. And interestingly, I don't think it's coincidental that uh, the history I, I, I choose um, kind of has those same, that same periodicity as the one we're hearing about, the World War II moment and the kind of 1970s, 80s, 90s moment. And the second point of connection is that the, pro, the, the lecture today will focus a lot on the significance of identity and the way that identity is forged with and through technologies and, and the, the, trend, the meat significance of that. And that is also, of course, a, a central theme of, of uh, the Ukraine war. 
So with that, uh, let me launch uh, my slides. And um, you should be able to see them now. Uh, let me fix that. All right. Um, uh, one more caveat before I begin is that the research that I will be discussing is really in its early stages. And uh, so the kind of the insights, uh, the comments I will share with you are high level and provisional, but hopefully it will spark enough connections to what all of you are thinking and, and studying that we can find important elements to discuss together. The topic that I'm going to discuss today really emerged organically from a teaching environment. And that's why I'm really excited again about the project that Claudia and Susan and are leading and, and I understand also many more faculty members are leading at AUP to teach data science and the human sciences together. So over the past three years, I have taught ethics of data and computing in UC University of California, Berkeley. And today at Berkeley, thousands of students are being taught, quote unquote, data literacy to prepare them for life and citizenship in the datafied world of the 21st century. This is an image of um, a class called Data 8, Fundamentals of Data Science, with over 1,500 students in the fall of 2018. This was the largest course on campus. Now, this is not my class. I did not teach data age. Uh, I, I'm not a <laughs> statistician or, or a computer scientist to teach this course. But even though this is not my class, these are my students because it was my role to teach uh, about, to, to teach to this group of students ethics and uh, thinking about the social and not just to teach the content, but also to try to work together with computer scientists and statisticians about how to teach that context. What is a form of integrating thinking about the human and the technical that should be part of a curriculum of an aspiring young person today? And seeing kind of the students' passion about issues of uh, data science and social justice, and then also myself, just, you know, if you think about the last three years, I know we all kind of have similar experiences, <laughs> uh, experiencing the growing presence of the digital in our lives during these, this time. I formulated what I uh, believe to be one of the main ethical challenges and conditions of our present day technological societies. And it centers on what I call the calculus of human worth. Now, at one level, this calculus of human worth entails literally computing numerical representations for every human trait that is relevant to characterizing, sorting, grouping, and governing people. Now, this is a working definition, and I'm trying to constantly test and refine this definition during the course of the research project. So feel free to uh, treat it with a grain of salt and suggest ways in which you know, the concept and the, the way in which to define it kind of makes or doesn't make sense. But there are many examples of, of, of practices that can fall under this, uh, this kind of uh, definition and concept. So for example, today, data science and computing are used to assess intelligence quotients and exam grades. They're used to uh, determine home values that then go on to determine taxation rates and mortgages. They're used to establish risk assessment scores like a credit risk score or a defendant's likelihood to recommit a crime. They're used to evaluate a person's likelihood to be a quote unquote fit for a particular job or their likelihood of needing a certain medical procedure in the future. So each of these indicators is, I think, importantly kind of, uh, used in our societies to assess an individual's worth in relation to others in society and to determine what each is owed and what they owe. As a condition of contemporary life in today's technological societies, such calculations of human worth facilitated by computing have reframed the self and forms of human action that are at the center of ethical thought. So to give this concept a little more specificity, or perhaps to you know, <laughs> tell, <laughs> give you ideas of how it can be challenged, um, I want to share with you some, a few examples of the calculus of human worth from present day France. So I think no, uh, no single indicator or digital representation is as important to our present day life in France as the past sanitaire. Uh, less conspicuous, however, are other systems working in the background to monitor compliance with public health mandates. So for example, this story that the RATP has been testing a machine vision system of video surveillance for mask wearing compliance. Computer vision technologies installed on RATP video cameras were used to see if passengers were complying with mask mandates in transport. 
In another area of health, uh, you may have heard the story of the formation of the Health Data Hub. This was uh, conceived as a platform of health data, collecting all the data produced by the French public health system and making it available anonymously also to researchers. In January, this story in Le Monde came out, which reported that the project was being withdrawn for the time being because of concerns about Microsoft, which provided the technical backbone for the hub. Now, another area in which we see the calculus of human worth in France today is in the space of verifying compliance. Uh, for various financial institutions. So the French Direction Générale de la Finance Publique uses machine learning techniques to detect financial fraud. These systems identify criteria that characterize fraudulent activity in order to create profiles of fraud that are then applied to a target population in order to identify individuals who, would, who, who could be audited. This, uh, the image I put on this slide shows a screenshot of the 2020 Projet de Loi de Finances, where uh, the government proposed a new article, you see the article 57 here pictured, that sought to allow um, government agencies to collect and analyze data made available publicly on social media sites in order to supplement the, uh, the, you know, the, the data already available uh, through other sources and it, for the detection of fraud. But perhaps no fraud detection system would be necessary after the next project comes online. And this is the project called Alison, which proposes to create a biometric facial identification system for accessing government services across all sectors of French administration. Citizens would register their biometric information with an app and then use this to make administrative procedures that might otherwise require an in-person justification of identity. This would be the first biometric database of all uh, of the government, of all citizens. And there emerged public concern about possible misuses of the biometric data set and also security issues uh, that contributed to slowing down the deployment of, of this application, which was expected for 2020. I haven't seen yet a new date of when it might come online. But even if French government biometric data, database for citizens is temporarily on hold, we can be sure that the biometric data is actively being collected all the time on the border. And here is a story about uh, Tails, which is a French company and um, a partnership with Edemia, another French biometric technologies company, both French kind of global leaders in biometric technology that whose services and technologies are used at French borders and at many countries' international borders in order to comply with new security measures uh, around the world. So a few observations about this a uh, few set of examples, which are wide ranging in terms of their the spaces of life that they cover from security to public services, to public health, to research, finance, transportation. Um, we see though that all of them kind of can be grouped under this category of the calculus of human worth because they all entail computing representations of human traits, identity numbers, facial signatures, risk scores, uh, profiles, uh, whether health or financial, masked or unmasked classifications. Now, um, and they're all using these representations for taking action, to give a service or a resource to set or enforce certain kinds of policies. Now, um, first observation I want to make is that all of these, what's interesting, if we're talking about the calculus of human worth, it's not just about a single technology. It's not about an app or an algorithm. It's about the entire socio-technical system in which the technology sits um, and the interaction between the social and the technical. So that means the interaction between the institutional and cultural context of the technology, which are really essential and inseparable from its own function. Another observation is that while some of these uh, might be uh, examples that we, did, we just talked about might be obviously considered as high risk or labeled as high risk under current notions of what is a risky and not risky technology, um, such as, for instance, facial recognition or, or health data collections, mostly each of these is routine, quotidian, and banal, and it may not be problematic in itself. And this is linked to the third observation that um, actually, these are really deemed necessary. They're essential in many ways for everyday life, especially in a COVID slash post-COVID world. 
uh, they are illegitimate, right? They're vetted by data protection mechanisms that authorize them, sometimes reconfigure them slightly. These are not rogue examples, and they are all intentioned to do good. They're aimed at social goods, at the provision and just provision and efficient provision of scarce resources and uh, within society. Now, the last point is that very similar to the first point about socio-technical systems, um, that these, all of these individual examples, I think you cannot, cannot look at any one of them and, 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 and create you know, and, and discuss any one of them uh, in, in depth without really considering the way in which they, they resonate with one another. And this concept of resonance comes, I first found it in um, a wonderful work by Louisa Moore, a political theorist, geographer, and a scholar of technology that you might know, uh, who herself kind of cites William Connolly, uh, who cites Deleuze and Guattari, basically a long trajectory of scholars who think about resonance as an alternative way to think about the way in which um, uh, multiple factors depend upon one another. So displacing kind of causal understandings to mutual interdependence, to infiltration of one another, that kind of metabolize into a moving com a complex. And that, that I propose that resonance is a helpful way in which we can think about the concept of the calculus of human worth. Now, my broader argument is that together as a practice, uh, 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 the calculus of human worth is a help forges subjectivities. And it, it, it captures and transforms the forms of governance. And together, this constrains and defines how we live as human beings, who we can become, how we can develop our personality. Now, these kinds of uh, systems, that the, the examples of which I just gave, have been uh, similar systems, have been discussed in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of literature in the last years. And many scholars have discussed them with concern, kind of the way that uh, Celeste Schenk has introduced this topic about issues about bias, about injustice, kind of um, being, being drawn attention to in these systems. So this book by Virginia Eubanks called Automating Inequality from 2018 describes case after case of algorithms used to help to administer resources of care and housing to the poor that contribute to the greater surveillance and control of these populations. Another prominent story in the American context, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, is by Julia Angwin and colleagues from ProPublica, who studied the Compass algorithm in 2016 and found that uh, this algorithm, which is used to give defendants recidivism risk scores in order to determine pretrial detention decisions, continuously consistently rated Black defendants as higher risk than white defendants. Another parallel story is that by uh, Ziad Obermeyer and colleagues um, uh, in, appeared in Science in 2019, where um, they, call it, they studied a commercial algorithm used in the US healthcare system to assign risk scores to patients in order to guide healthcare decisions and found that the algorithm deprioritized Black patients from receiving preventative care. And I'm sure in the European context, you're also familiar with this story about the UK exam algorithm um, debate when due to COVID university entrance exams were canceled in the UK in the spring of 2020 and an algorithm was used to assign students a grade and students particularly less well-off students uh, st students from particularly less well-off schools got marks that were below what their teachers had indicated the grade would be. Now these sets of critiques are compelling and urgent and uh, most of them are focused, as the article title suggests, on inequality and bias. And this focus makes sense, especially given the social and political context in which these problems came to light. Uh, right from 2016 to the present, we have the whole sequence of events with the election of President Trump, uh, killings of African Americans, rise uh, and, and, and people of color in the United States, uh, rise of violence um, against immigrants, a resurgence of anti-racism movement. So these critiques of focus on distributive and allocative frames really do make sense in that context. But what I see is a dimension that kind of lurks more in the background of these uh, explicit attention to bias and inequality that I think requires more attention. What I see is uh, in these examples is a kind of existential frame that is less about allocation and distribution about equality and inequality than it is about representation. 
about uh, who gets to speak for whom and how, and that in, in, intimately involves questions of personality and identity. So in these same stories, there are these undercurrents and references to, to issues of representation and, and identity. So for instance, uh, in the UK example, we see, uh, you know, we see, saw posters like this where students uh, said, your algorithm doesn't know me. Or in the ProPublica article, um, the authors uh, tell the story of uh, Paul Zilli, who was arrested in Wisconsin for stealing a push lawnmower and convicted to two years in prison because he had a high risk score assigned to him by the Compass algorithm. And this is a, a, a quote from, from, from the authors of that, uh, of, of that piece that says, Paul Zilli said, the score didn't take into account all the changes he was making in his life his conversion to Christianity, his struggles to quit using drugs, and his efforts to be more available for his son. Not that I'm innocent, but I just believe people do change, Zilli had said. So I think these examples speak to a kind of dissonance between uh, what the algorithm says about people, who the algorithm says people are, how it represents them, and their own sense of themselves who they believe they are in the present and who they believe they can become in the future. And this dissonance centers on misrecognition and on a depriving of a certain potential, two essential features, misrecognition and potential, of how today we um, in, in kind of Western contemporary societies, generally speaking, uh, perhaps I should be more careful about generalities there, but um, understand human identity and um, recognition and potential, uh, I, I argue from, from what I've been reading and studying is at the core of how we understand our contempt of what it means to be human and what it means to live a dignified life among others. So a little bit about this concept of recognition and, and its relationship to, to dignity. So it's widely accepted in modern societies that quote, recognition by others forges identity. So Charles Taylor in his, um, one of his kind of works, Politics of Recognition writes, our identity is partly shaped by recognition or its absence, often by the misrecognition of others. And so a person or group of people can suffer real damage, real distortion, if the people or society around them near back to them a confining or demeaning or contemptible picture of themselves. The idea that, uh, as Taylor puts it, recognition forges identity has been recognized since the 18th century. I mean, at least, um, probably can take it further back. But I find it interesting that even Adam Smith, in his writings about the importance of wealth, um, discussed how, uh, observed that when people seek wealth, they don't seek it necessarily for material possessions, but they seek it for recognition, as he said, to be observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy. Um, so there's this recognition that the significance of recognition for identity, a, a feeling that misrecognition can contribute to the malformation of identity or can harm or can oppress, and a related notion about potential. So if recognition is something that deals with uh, my sense of the sense of the present and of the past, who one is, Potential is something about an open future, right? And a, a, a capacity to, to become. So I think it's interesting how between the two concepts, recognition and potential kind of cover the spectrum of, of, of time and time significance for, for, for human identity. Now, why, uh, you know, why recognition in relation to, to dignity? Now, uh, in, I, want to, I want to kind of speak a little bit about dignity because my hypothesis is that what's kind of what's underlying contemporary concerns around algorithmic systems um, is not just, you know, as we, we frequently are, are used to hearing and saying, uh, loss of privacy or bias or inequality or uh, state surveillance, these kind of um, uh, really kind of bo uh, bo black box in many ways words, concepts that we, we strategically in many times deploy to, to try to grasp towards kind of what we feel to be unsettling about our present lives with, in relationships with technologies. 
um, I, I believe that there's something broader and, and more uh, related to identity there, which is about dignity. So this concept of human dignity. Now, the concept of human dignity, I think uh, Claudia and, and, and Susan and, and yet any others who work on human rights probably will, tell, will realize, recognize um, is a very fuzzy concept. And that's part of its role and part of its history. But here I find a really helpful definition of it, since definitions are useful for trying to precise what we're talking about. This is a definition by scholar Rhoda Howard from 1992. And she defines dignity as the, quote, particular cultural understandings of the inner moral worth of the human person and his or her proper political relations with society. Now, I want to find out two things about this definition which really kind of matter and which are important to, to, to thinking about dignity. The first is that the cultural specific piece. Because it's very frequently that dignity is such a universal notion that we think of it as always and ever the same and always and ever applicable in the same ways to all people at all times. But this definition highlights the significance of cultural specificity uh, and opens up the definition of dignity to change and in cultural interpretation. Uh, so even though dignity is, is posited as inalienable so much, so frequently, we can see uh, how it might vary over time in culture and mean different things to different people. And second piece of this definition that is really important to say about dignity, another sort of an intuitive way thing, is that um, dignity has this very deep inner component, individual focused component, inner moral worth, as uh, uh, Howard says here. But that, that, that's not it. That's not the whole extent of it. It's also a concept that takes its meaning within societies, right? It, it, it both speaks about names and, and, takes its, uh, and, and takes the significance of the inner from the proper political relations with society in which a person, in which that inner uh, individual piece is forged. So these two components, the, the cultural specificity of the meaning of dignity and the, uh, the fact that dignity is not only about inner moral worth, but it also about proper political relations in societies is, is really crucial. Now, if we talk about dignity changing, I think it's useful to think about how, uh, how in very schematic form, dignity has evolved uh, through, through the ages. And through the ages here, I'm going, I am restricting myself to, to something I know more of because the other piece I know actually nothing of. <laughs> Um, I mean, that is, I know more, much more about the, West, the, Western, uh, the Western tradition in this, in this case. Uh, so human dignity in the, his, through the ages of, of Western thought and, 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 and reason. It's um, what, what, this, what this history that I want to briefly, briefly paint in this slide shows is that uh, always there is a positing in each age, there's a positing that human being has dignity, but why? what makes human beings unique? And this idea of what makes humans unique, what is exceptional about the human that, that, that gives dignity to the human, that is different in different contexts. So in, um, in Greek and Roman thought, for example, human uniqueness uh, stemmed from the ability, the human ability to exercise virtuous control over herself and her environment. So over, her, uh, over one's own passions, feelings, and uh, environment, animals, or nature. So the ability to exercise virtual control over oneself and one's environment was a kind of unique condition of the human that uh, warranted dignity. In uh, Christian thought, uh, the, 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 the concept of dignity stemmed from the, the uniqueness to the human because human beings were, are seen to be divine creations uh, made uh, in the image of God. And having the capacity to choose through uh, to, to choose and to know good from evil. In Western modern philosophy, especially with Kant, there is a kind of grounding of dignity on uh, the conception of human being as a rational, autonomous agent that that can uh, that has capacity to determine their fate. So, so this is similar in many ways to the Christian capacity to choose morality, but instead of basing on faith and, and on, on the divine, it is based on the, the perception of a human being as a rational agent who can 
um, who commands respect and therefore should is, is worthy uh, of is is dignified is worthy because um, they're capable of directing their lives through the adherence of certain principles developed rationally through the process of reason. And in this time, in the 18th century, um, it is a very interesting move that links this idea of reason and capacity to direct one's life through reason um, and through, through the choice of, of certain principles to uh, the importance of an individualized identity. And this here, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is important. And, um, and he kind of says, emphasizes how central it is for a human being to discover uh, their own, their own um, kind of intimate, have rediscover and have one's own intimate contact with oneself. That is so foundational to having this, uh, you know, reason moral view. And that's the source of joy and contentment and, and the foundation upon which that, that makes the humans, uh, human being worthy uh, of, of dignity. So few obser two observations about this, this evolution. Um, one is the linking of dignity and individualized identity, which I think is really interesting and important in kind of in conversations about dignity and digital technologies in the present. Um, so, so the human's exceptionalism comes to be linked to the ability of the human to have their identity and the need to have recognition uh, and potential to fulfill that identity, to, to become, become human in a specific way of an individual. And second uh, observation is that dignity in each tradition serves as a kind of heuristic or a diagnostic of what qualities are deemed in that culture and that political context to make a person worthy of respect or to make them entitled to certain forms of protection from abuses. And so that's very interesting, I think, that, that dignity has that function of being a diagnostic about what is the essence of being human that therefore needs to be somehow protected and taken care of um, in society. So that's the thing that I use that word taking care of, and that's, um, that's very specific uh, kind of language to actually another moment in the history of dignity of its evolution. And the history of dignity would not be complete in any way without mention of this crucial 20th century uh, moment of the writing of the UN Declaration of Human Rights after World War II, where dignity is literally announced um, as a foundation of a new international law and the basis for the granting of human rights. As one wonderful scholar, Gaiman Bennett, uh, who has studied dig human dignity extensively uh, in relation to bioethics, he, as, he, uh, as he says, dignity was not demonstrated, established, argued about, defined, or specified. It was put forward, it was announced as a self-evident uh, and prescriptive notion. And I think this is um, not just I think uh, scholars have discussed how important this kind of um, position of dignity as being always already there is for uh, the history of international law and, and, and the development of, of human rights and constitutional law as well. For in so many countries where dignity plays an important role in kind of grounding a constitutional order. Um, it, it creates a uh, the kind of the under definition, if you will, of the concept, the um, positing it as, as inalienable and as always already there, um, creates a kind of stable, specific anthropology um, that's pretty primordial and calls for a certain mode of care. And here that's where I'm kind of repeating this concept of care, uh, care for dignity, that is much more about protection than it is about creation or cultivation. So um, the, it's important to, uh, pr dignity is always already there for human beings, as, as the article one says of the declaration, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And the demand on society is to, on societies, is to protect that innate reality. Um, and you see in the illustrated version of the Declaration of Human Rights, which you can find on, on the internet, uh, the, author, the illustrator chose to really highlight this significance of, uh, of being born, of being alive, kind of a, a, a biologically grounded idea of dignity 
that is really kind of a, at the foundation of the declaration that's kind of um, in, in, in encapsulated in this image of a person breaking through uh, an eggshell, being born. Now it's this relationship between dignity and biological life that also, um, that also has a significance for the way that the concept of human dignity gets taken up in relation to biotechnologies. So there's an understanding, right, with, with uh, Howard's definition of dignity, we saw there's an understanding that dignity changes through ages and through times and different cultures, it takes on different meanings. And I think uh, the history of human dignity's relationship to uh, biotechnologies and in bioethics debates shows that there's also an understanding that, that what human dignity means varies with scientific and technological knowledge and capacity to act in the world. And so debates about, uh, you know, about cloning or abortion or stem cells have frequently involved conceptions of dignity. But what's interesting is that uh, this understanding that with changing scientific and technological knowledge and capacity to act, this understanding does not very much um, move towards the direction of uh, thinking about dignity in relation to data and information technologies or computing technologies. It remains with the realm of the bio, the, the realm of life. And you know, I have, I have theories about why, why that is the case. Why don't we think with dignity as much as we think of with dignity in context of biotechnologies as we think with dignity in for data protection regulation, for example. But that kind of raises this core question that, that um, uh, I would like to kind of work through the remainder time that we have today is how does the concept of human dignity co-evolve with uh, the changing socio-technical practices of the calculus of human worth? What is that relationship? Can, is there a relationship between uh, human dignity, what it means to be human as, as, a, as, di as a dignity diagnosis in society, and uh, how we in society kind of live and work with these uh, uh, representations of ourselves and one another uh, with, uh, in, in information, with the help of an in information technology. So to, um, begin to answer this question, we need to look back at earlier eras of the calculus of human worth, because the whole question presupposes a history, a co-evolution and a transformation over time. So the calculus of human worth, of course, is not new, and it certainly does not require digital computing to be done. Applying calculations to human worth has been a persistent project of societies, sometimes with tragic consequences. At the end of the 19th century, English mathematician and statistician Francis Galton developed the foundational statistical tool of regression as part of a project of eugenics to differentiate desirable from undesirable people. And this is widely seen as an emergence of scientific racism, the practice of racializing and gendering human populations with data and statistics in order to govern them. Decades later, the pre-digital information technologies of the Hollerith machine and the punch card were used to collect and analyze information about Germans in ways that made it possible for the Nazi regime to identify and murder millions of Jews and others during the Holocaust. And in South Africa during apartheid, scales for comparing the color of skin such as this one was among many technologies used for race discrimination. So of these, of this, uh, kind of these three examples, um, one of them really stands out when we focus our attention on the role of computing specifically in the making of the calculus of human worth. Um, so that is of course the, the role of punch cards and the Hollerith machine as an early mechanical, electromechanical computing that's significant. And so the, uh, for the history that I want to tell today, I'd like to kind of touch upon three moments. Um, the moment of, of punch cards and uh, sorting, uh, you know, sorting machines from the early 19th century to the 1950s and the kind of around world wars. The moment of public computing from 1960s to 1990s, and we already discussed examples from the present kind of ubiquitous computing moment of today, so I won't go there. So each of these moments or eras 
um, has a certain technology at its heart, right? From the punch card systems to early computing that is kind of made uh, made public, and the personal information of personal computer to today's networked, um, you know, artificial intelligence systems. But each of these technologies also corresponds and kind of is accompanied, is co-produced with certain form, kinds of governance that this calculus uh, is put to work on. And there are specific citizen state relationships that are at stake in each case. And each, in each moment, there are also resistances to the calculus and expressions of the incalculable that, that humans have. So, um, my first stop on this really uh, whirlwind history of the calculus of human worth is in the 1960s, 1990s moment. Um, here is, uh, in this period, as I, many of you uh, might have lived through and know, again, much more intimately um, than, than, than I, um, computers were, quote unquote, moving into, as this Time magazine cover says, living rooms, schools, public spaces. And in a book project I'm working on, um, it, these, these, uh, these computers were uh, used to specifically teach children. In, in, I, I look at it in three countries, in the US, France, and the Soviet Union, uh, to uh, actively introduce them to computer literacy and culture pro computer culture programs. Pioneers of these computer literacy and computer culture programs were preoccupied with forming the citizens of the information age. Their programs, importantly, aim not just to teach instrumental skills for operating the machines, but to reconstitute humans, to develop new ways of thinking and belonging in society. The computer was an artifact imagined to be integral to individual lives and identities, as integral as the traditional instruments of reading and writing. According to one French television program, computers were, quote, tools for people to dream and build lives with. Now, computer literacy pioneers uh, intentionally refuted reductionist representations of people as computable data points, and in fact, aimed to empower the next generation to really know the computer deeply. People were invited to take calculations literally into their own hands, as this image shows, uh, illustrates, and discover new reservoirs of potential within themselves and in partnership with the computer. But like traditional literacy, computer literacy could equally be a tool of flourishing through new capacities of self-expression, at the same time as a new power tool of social discipline and control. And in this story of early computing, we already see tensions between calculability and its moral limits. One way to represent this tension is that it is between the dreams of the computer's potential for the flourishing of the calculable, so a, a person who is a human being who is capable of calculating, who knows how to calculate, who is computer literate, or today we might say data literate, and the potential violence of calculation when it treats the human as a subject of calculation, the calculable subject. So it's an interesting kind of play on words here. Um, this period of public computing there is simultaneously a moment of transformation in subjectivity, as well as transformation in governance practices with computers. And it is a moment of uh, big contestation. So in resistance. So for example, at Berkeley during the free speech movement, when leftist students rose up and demanded the expansion of civil rights on campus, students protested against being treated as quote, near information to be processed by metaphorical university machines. Students transformed the punch card, the symbol of information machines oppression into a symbol of resistance by punching out the letters FSM for free speech movement on the punch cards. And in, they carried signs that read, I am a University of California student, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate me. In defiance of the inscription, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate, that used to be written on punch cards as injunctions to human users to treat the cards well so that they could be read by the machines. 
So this was a really uh, clever uh, you know, transformation of the technology and I think kind of revealing of the way in which the, the, the students held and understand, understood their, uh, their worth in relation to not just these systems, technical systems, but the whole context of the university and the government in which it was enmeshed. And um, a few years later in France, um, in the, another story that probably I would love to talk with some of you who might know more intimately, even intimately um, about, they, uh, there was a big, uh, a big moment for reckoning with the new forms of governance computing enabled um, uh, through the making public of this uh, project called Project Safari, which took place in 1971-1973, organized by INSEE, the Institut National de la Statistique et des Etudes Économiques, which decided to centralize the identification directories that it held in the city of Nantes. And then later added to that centralization project, another set of directories that were held uh, in the city of Tours from a different government agency, the Caste Nationale de Sciences Villiers. So you have to pull these different registries together in a way that really began to trouble people. And uh, really an interesting uh, person in the story here is um, the journalist of Le Monde, Philippe Boucher, who in 1974 published this a wonderfully titled article um, uh, denouncing the project. Uh, he called the title Safari, the name of the project, ou la chasse au français, or the hunt of the French. And revealed uh, kind of revealed the project and started sparked a large public debate about what were these centralization efforts by the government using the new computing technologies, and what kind of uh, you know what kind of consequences they might have. Important to this context was the role of collective memory of World War II. And uh, as some as statisticians and historians have argued, a misreading of the past. But I think, again, uh, a, a, a telling and a significant misreading because of, of the kind of action that it prompted. And importantly, the thing it prompted was the creation of a very, uh, you know, one of the first uh, data protection regulations in the world, uh, which is still remains a model of data protection uh, regulation and governance, and has been instrumental to the development of the GDPR and has proven to be very flexible and adaptable to changing technological contexts, which is the Loi Informatique et Liberté and the CNIL, the Commission Nationale Informatique et Liberté that, that is created. So the public debate really culminated in this vote for the Loi Informatique et Liberté in 1978 and the establishment of the commission to make sure that whatever uh, uh, you know, uses informatique would be put to in the future, that it would not infringe upon, uh, that it would first be in the service of each citizen, a service de chaque citoyen, and that it would not then infringe upon the identity humaine, the droit des hommes, the vie privée, or the liberté, individual or public ones, that the French are guaranteed. So I think it's really interesting that there is a, um, a memory of World War II here and the violations of the war and the, uh, again, the, I'll tell say a, a minute, uh, some, a little more about that, that uh, story. And that there is this, there is no mention of dignity here, but something I'm trying to make sense of is the relationship between uh, kind of dignity as, it's, as a concept that's around at this time and, and how it's being discussed in this time of law and in, in public thought and the way in which it's kind of refracted in this loi informatique, which, which uh, puts together this, this list of topics, you know, human identity and human identity. So opposing it to a numerical identity, um, human rights, la vie privée and liberties. So um, it is a, a kind of a research question for me to understand okay, where's dignity here and how is it, again, yeah, like, do we see it or do we not see it in these various um, other concepts that are more closer to the language of data protection, um, right? Questions of identity, questions of, of privacy, questions of, of liberties. So collective memory, I mentioned, collective memory crucial to the making of this law and of the making of data protection in, in general. And what that collective memory refers to is the calculus of human worth in World War II. And this is where 
very, very briefly, I'm going to touch upon this uh, earliest moment in the story, which is the, Meka, Me, the, the moment of Mecca uh, and, and the war. And again, this is just one slide. And here for this one slide, I'm heavily basing um, on, on the wonderful work of, of historian Lars Heide from uh, Netherlands and a French demographer and statistician, Michel Louis Levy. And they've written extensively about this main character in the story, René Carmille, in the image here, who was an engineer trained at the École Polytechnique and who used punch cards in order to um, create an army mobilization register. And then in 1940, he proposed to the Vichy regime to expand the scope of the register beyond its original stated purpose to create a national register. So not just the mobilization register for the purposes of mobilization, but a register of all French for purposes of general statistical knowledge about the population, not necessarily army war focus. And uh, this was a huge project. It involved, it employed almost 2000 people, um, uh, you know, 22 punching machines, uh, 200 punching machines, 22 sorters, 14 tabulators, lots of machinery, thousands of people. Um, and Carmille developed the, uh, the register on a basis of a written file and two punch cards for each individual. The file was designed to include a description of a person's life from birth to death, including four photographs taken of them at different ages and contain all kinds of information like data, place of data and place of birth, parents, marriage, divorce, children, day, death date, nationality, address. It did not contain anything about religion, importantly. And the first punch card collected encoded information for compiling various kinds of census statistics. And the second card held the name and the current address of the person. So the government could actually mail something directly to a person because it knew the address, the current address of each, of each person. Yeah, so that was one of the, and so they could, they could sort, they could perform all kinds of uh, you know, sorting processes on these, on these cards, and they could uh, have a new capacity to identify and, and connect with any, any citizen at any moment. Now, another piece of, of uh, Carmel's innovation here and technology here was that these, uh, these three, the file and two punch cards were linked by a common identification number, the national identification number. So here was the birth of the French social security number. And this number importantly is not random. It has a history that's directly linked, its format is linked to, to, to the moment when it was established because uh, it began as this army project, right, for, for conscripts. So recruiting uh, young men when they became eligible by age. So the, the number begins with the, uh, the first number is either one or two, one being male, two being female, so that you could identify the male, uh, you know, the, the males in order to um, enroll and enlist them in the army. Then comes the year of birth, the month of birth, etc. I will not go into the what components of this number, but basically you can see how the history of this number traces back to its original core function and then gets deployed as the standard number that um, all French have today. Now, important, one last thing about Carmilla, and then I come to my conclusion. I, I realize I'm over time. Um, and please, Celeste or Jessica, if you would like to cut me at any point and tell me to hurry, um, tell me. I think I have another five minutes. That's you fine. Take, take your time, okay. Margaret. Right, it's thanks. fascinating. It's fascinating. Thank All right, thank you. Um, so one last thing to say about this moment of the war. Uh, the, the register that Carmille created and the social security number were actually never used for the deportation of Jews in France. Uh, it is said that Carmille deliberately resisted attempts to link the work that he was working on, um, that he was overseeing, to, uh, to, to he would resisted attempts to link this work with the information that was gathered uh, by the Prefecture de Police in a 1941 census called the Census of Jews in Vichy, France. And Carmille was part of the French resistance and he was deported to Dachau concentration camp where he died in 1944. So his number, the insane number, the social security number and his project were never used, but there's still the memory of the capacity uh, and, and the, another file which was referred to as the fichier juif, 
was create that was created by the prefecture de police was uh, used for the perse persecution of Jews. But it is interesting that in the memory of the 1978 moment um, that Philippe Boucher discusses in Le Monde's article and that sparks all that debate about governance and information technology in 1978, uh, this, this capacity and the potential, the power of these the tools for violence is, is, is there necessarily in the public. Okay, so my, I come to my conclusion, which is a, a few slides long. When you visit the Memorial de la Shoa in the Marais district today, you first come to a room that, um, uh, that is a picture here. It, it shows this, the Star of David, and inside under the eternal flame are ashes collected from Auschwitz and uh, that had been uh, repatriated with soil brought from Israel and buried there underneath the star. And then, uh, in the same space, and you can see behind the Star of David uh, in the back behind those uh, glass doors, there is a little doorway on the left-hand side of the image under the staircase. That is where the National Archives um, with Jacques Chirac uh, have placed the fichier juif. So that is the, that filing uh, system that was created to identify the Jews and to uh, deport them. So I think that when I visited here a few months ago, I was struck by this connection between the a way of making dignified memory you know, that combines the de-identified, right? By, by definition, uh, collective remains, physical remains, with a very individual um, individual memory and identity that is still the system of oppression, but also the system that enables the survivors to come to terms with what, with what happened, to identify who was deported, to find records. So I think it's this tension between the, uh, the violence and the necessity, um, more than necessity, the humanity of identification with the kind with the information calculus, calculation systems that we have, that, that is really at the heart of, of what we are living today and what we have to grapple with, how necessary uh, and is, it is for our collective lives. Today, we are living based mostly on what can be calculated while filtering out what cannot. We tend to act as if what is incalculable doesn't matter or is irrelevant to seeing the picture clearly. We believe that we can get close enough to the real phenomenon by approximating it with an error deemed small enough to be acceptable. We are ready to admit that there may be something beyond the calculable, but it is said to be irrelevant for action. Patricia Williams, a scholar of law and technology who I admire greatly, describes the phenomenon and the consequence of the loss. She says, what is ruled as excess is lost. Our technology cannot read this but it's the excess that must be brought to a child custody hearing or to the care of a COVID patient. What technology cannot read continues to play a central role in human ethical relations and in the maintenance and reproduction of social order. At the same time as the deployment of calculation of human worth is the, uh, in the social world is expanding, its limits are thrust into view. In 2020, we experienced a forced experiment in digital life. And when the quarantine was announced in 20, March 2020 uh, in the United States, I was in this beautiful location in the California coast and took this photograph of this completely empty, right? A natural scene with a sign that warns visitors about COVID. So to me, this is one of the many images that we have of, of trying to understand and grapple with, with uh, the way in which our lives have been uh, sort of for one, to mention just one little piece of what has had changed in our lives, thrust into the digital. The move to virtual sociality across all domains of life exposed and exacerbated the differential valuation of human life in our societies. Between rich and poor, women and men in the labor force, educated elites and the marginalized, residents and migrants, and majority populations versus ethnic and racial minorities. Wealth became even more concentrated in fewer hands, and the forces of authoritarianism, supported by tsunamis of disinformation on social media, seem to gain strength, while trust in many established institutions eroded. It's not surprising, I think, that in this context, today we see new calls for justice, 
that echo calls for justice during the US civil rights movement of the 1960s and the European student uprisings of the same period. This insists not on better or more calculable, accurate calculability, but on the incalculable, on recognition, on speech, on breath. Conceptions of inalienable and incalculable human dignity are now making their way into law. Such ideas are at the core of the GDPR and its invention of the so-called data subject to recognize that people are at the origin of data. The GDPR gives the subject the power to summon the fractured data points to a coherent entity of the self with the legal rights to self-determination that living people have. And so the European Data Protection Supervisor can say something like that he considers that better respect for and safeguarding of human dignity could be the counterweight to the pervasive surveillance and asymmetry of power, which now confronts the individual, echoing, um, recasting dignity uh, into a mechanism to empower an individual against the corporation or against an oppressive state. Similarly, very similarly to the moment in the writing of the Declaration of Human Rights after World War II, when the Ashan Aran said, naked human, um, naked human, not a citizen, a refugee, was given rights by virtue of their being human against the sovereign state. So in summary, we think of human dignity as a fixed quality, but I think what it means, how it coheres as an idea, how it operates in the world, co-evolves with the changing calculus of human worth. The calculus of human worth are, as we said, socio-technical practices that characterize, sort, group people so as to govern them. They have evolved from these machines, powerful new mechanical tools at the time of the state only. These were not people's two machines for gaining new population level insights and ability to keep track and target individuals in this mechanography era to nimbler, more granular techniques that allow new forms of centralized state power, but also require new forms of engagement with and by the public, such that citizens were expected to take into their own hands these tools. Two, today's data and computing technologies that enable more, deeper, wider applications of the calculus of human worth. Today, larger volumes of data, more sophisticated algorithmic models enable the identification of patterns far beyond human capacity to identify unaided. Before it was a metaphor, now we have so much computing and so much data that people have become calculable on many more dimensions and dependent upon these calculations for daily life and self-knowledge. The concept of human dignity, the concept of the human has evolved with these systems. In the 1940s, dignity emerges from the ashes of World War II in order to secure the so-called naked human uh, against the violence of the sovereign state to assert a single human truth that they are worthy by the fact of being born human at the foundation of a new legal order. Something new begins to take shape in the 60s. The empowerment of the computer able, computable self go hand in hand with a power that can be asserted over the computable subject. Although the power of the state armed with information technologies harken back to the abuses of World War II, the new attractions and promises of public computing begin to rewrite the idea of the person and citizen that can no longer oppose a naked human against the state or against the technology. And in the first data protection laws, the concept of dignity is dissipated into these various elements, private life, privacy, uh, human identity, liberties. And then our contemporary moment of ubiquitous computing that's marked by thirst, I think, for struggle and struggle for recognition, whose significance we see play out today as much in social media as on the city battlefields of Ukraine. We expect that proper recognition will be accorded to us through our technologies. And we are consistently thwarted in that wish. And then we see the law, you know, they're struggling, attempting to reassemble a notion of the human, an integral notion that includes the digital as an inseparable aspect of personhood. And I think this is fascinating and an incredible challenge for future students. And this is the final slide about uh, just two, three thoughts on the significance of all this for teaching. First, um, I think it just requires the kind of partnerships that, 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 uh, that, that are already at AUP. 
uh, between humanists, interpretive social scientists, and computer scientists to teach the next generation of students because we require the understanding of both the social and the technical systems together in order to understand how our societies have come to be the way they are and to co-evolve and shape the future. Second, um, I think we must put more emphasis on teaching students about the representational consequences of computing, not just the allocative frame, not just more and less, better and worse, but what's changing about who we are, our identities and how and how, how we represent ourselves and by whom. And third, um, in terms of uh, forms of engagement and to inspire in our students, I think we should support students um, and ourselves try to articulate best practices. That is not just technical, but also cultural and legal techniques to actively cultivate dignity in, in contemporary computing systems. Um, not just to protect some archaic idea of dignity, but to question what does it mean to be human? What does it mean today in a world of technology? And to consciously create and cultivate that humanity. And that's the fullest sense of human-centered design that I think we can aspire to. So I'm done. I apologize for, for taking longer than, than I should have. Um, thank you. I look forward to, to your, your thoughts and to the session. Not at all. That was that was an absolutely brilliant and comprehensive um, presentation, Margot, which really does, I think, border beautifully on the work that these students are doing with Claudia and Susan. And so I think everybody was just kind of amazed by that tour de force. <laughs> so I don't necessarily have a lot of things in the chat yet, but um, would anyone like to ask a question? Begin by asking a question. Um, maybe I'll go first. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Margot. This was uh, fascinating, and uh, um, and I have so many questions on on all your research work. But I will start from the from the end, from your last slide, yeah. and and I would like to know from from your experience when when you worked with the with the data science student in the human and context and ethic program. Um, what, are, what do you think are the, um, the, the, the best, easiest thing that we can get? What can we do immediately with our students? What have you seen working um, that, that you thought is worth doing? And what on the other side are the hardest thing to get through. I have some ideas, obviously, but <laughs> but I but I like to hear your experience. Um, some probably ideas will come to me <laughs> more as I think and talk and we talk. Also, I might have kind of recircle back in in, lay, in later answers to Claudia. But uh, what that, strangely, the first thing that comes to mind is really it's just conversation. You know. Um, that is most important to do. Uh, I, I found so many of our students had um, not just chosen data science and computer science as their majors in college, but have been trained in those, and have been working towards that uh, study, you know, since they were kids, since they were really, really little. So the capacity of them and the, and the opportunities that they have had to, to speak, to voice, themselves in uh, about you know about what's going on in, in their lives um, about you know the topics uh, of these courses on, on the human and, and technology has been has been so few few and far between you know they're 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 doing these data sets they're working on um, you know in labs they're used to answering uh, questions in in kind of in few sentences they they don't have the uh, the opportunity to speak, to, to voice, you know, uh, with others as much uh, in, about these issues and, they, and to write about them and to put themselves in it in a, not just in a, I think, kind of way, but in a sustained, um, thought, thought through, um, you know, reasoned capacity. So I find, I, and I, I think they appreciate that uh, opportunity, space to, to speak 
and to hear and to listen. And they also, and those are also the, the things that they require the most support with. Uh, how to let go of, of certain ideas about objectivity, how to think about you know, the significance of, of history as an example for, for the future, you know, um, those are unfamiliar. So, the, so it's both the, the most thing that the thing that they find most uh, exciting and, and, and open up the most through and the most well, the thing that requires most support. But the, I, I, I'll keep thinking because yeah, and I, and I wonder what, what you what you would say to your own question. Claudia, do you did you want to well you have a thought on that? Well, my 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 thing. I think what is the what has been the most difficult or and most rewarding when whenever that has happened um, has been exactly the the what where you were talking about when when we talk about what is not calculable because nowadays um, we are so convinced that and and it's part of the way we are raised the part in which the the way the society works that everything somehow it th there is some yeah. some approximation for everything right. and no I, I think that there are certain things that we cannot even approximate and uh, and creating an approximation simply creates something different is no longer what it was at the origin and i think this is this is not an easy um concept to come to term with it's a uh, um you know, it, it it's 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 just so much part of the way we are that it's it's difficult even for for students who are not computer scientists. Um, they take it for granted that things can be calculated, can be represented somehow. Yeah, I think uh, I really I, I agree with that. Really resonate with that. Um, and there's a and all in a, and I think all the uh, you know fears about being wrong uh, in a class or being kind of not object fears about not being objective you know and coming to terms with um, I think what we're talking about in part is this meeting of uh, meeting of the the methods and the knowledges of different disciplines and of um, coming together in, in, in conversation so when you know yeah, when, when students confront uh, uh, kind of the, the humanistic way of knowing, um, they, they realize that you can base, you know, a, a theory on experiences of individual stories, and they, they recognize that, the, the significance of that, the incalculability of that, in, you know, and the power of that individual account. Um, and I, yeah, I, I believe that it's a freedom that you discover. You know, you, you really realize people are free. You know, you have agency. You can change. <laughs> you have a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's really empowering. Exactly. I loved some of the examples that you gave. You know, to concretize this, and I think probably the students found these very useful. Like the person who had stolen. I mean, had stolen something, and by means of an algorithm, had been had received a sentence. And what he said is, you know, and, and I mean, he said that, I don't know in what context he said it. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that example. Did the speaking up about the person that I am becoming have any impact later on the punishment of that crime? That's a really interesting question. Um, so I think that he said that to, in probably an interview to the authors of the article. Um, so I wonder if, there was a kind of feedback between that and the actual case. My sense, my sense was so he was um, he because of a higher score, he was given two years in prison, really for like he stole a push you know push lawnmower. It wasn't even a mechanical lawnmower. like it was very <laughs> like yeah. With, I, I, I mean I'm not no knowledge of criminal <laughs> law cases, but it seems like a completely trivial case. And yet he has given, he had high score because he was, uh, um, according to the article, you know, he was black. He was given a high score and he, his uh, sentence was later commuted to 18 months. So instead, so, so he was given a higher sentence, which shouldn't have been because these algorithms are not supposed to be used for sentencing decisions. They're supposed to be used for purposes of 
identifying which uh, resources the defendant might benefit from and for setting bail. Mm -hmm. But of course, the numbers, you know, the power of the number is such that a judge sees this and cannot not take that into a kind of consideration in their own calculus of what is fair in this case. Anyway, so I think just um, that his, I, my, my feeling is his sentence was commute, commuted to 18 months later, but I don't know whether that was, probably that was due to a review of the score, but I don't know whether that was due to the action of the investigative mm -hmm. journalism mm -hmm. story. Certainly that story, and I'm, maybe many of you know of it, uh, is really powerful and it's just, a eye-opening example for many, many students. And actually many, um, as Claudia must know there, you know, the many um, problem sets have been written to uh, do the work that the investigative journalist did um, and kind of allow students to play with the data and see for themselves how different, taking different definitions of what is fair in this case, uh, what the algorithm optimizes for kind of has different outcomes Mm -hmm. and, and students recognize that there is a real uh, decision in the system, in the design of the algorithm that, that, that privileges a certain conception of, of what is racially just and mm -hmm. have to grapple with the fact that, wow, you know, our algorithms encode certain ideas of justice. They're, they're, they're not, yeah, they, you know, they're not meant to be. They're, they're off, the designers are trying to do the right thing. And they have these profound consequences. So questions of representation and democracy and who gets to decide are raised. And basically, this piece is a great piece for students and a great piece for kind of drawing the world's attention to, to algorithms and their representational consequences. So Margo, we have a couple of questions in the chat, one from Cliff Mahler. We are at the moment digitized representations of ourselves. Have we lost our dignity in this moment? Something feels less to me. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I feel it too. And at the same time, I feel this tension, right, that I keep mentioning is that the essential nature of uh, the way in which I cannot anymore say that I am, can, can be fully human without my digital representations. Um, we are fully, truly, fully informational persons. You know, we try to live a day without a uh, birth certificate, especially in France. You know, or like, or um, you know, a uh, right, a pass sanitaire, right? I mean, it, it, it's impossible. So it's necessary. Again, it's deemed, uh, it's ubiquitous. It's deemed good and and useful, and and yet something is missing. And yet, as Patricia Williams is, is just top on this, like you know, the way she articulates this lack, you know, this excess that is lost. And I cannot help thinking, and this is very. Uh, I mean, this, this is just an impression. I have no, um, you know, no, no deep knowledge about this, but, you know, there's been all of this conversation with, uh, about Putin, Vladimir Putin, and, and how as a result of uh, COVID, he has become alienated. And people talk about alienation there in a context of being kind of worried about the virus and physical distance of oneself from other people and kind of building this bubble. But I, I can't help thinking that there is also layered on that alienation, the, the kind of alienation that we all experience by kind of living a, you know, living our lives for the last few years, mainly uh, like this on screen, and how that enables, you know, I know it enables me to change how I think about the people I see on the Zoom call. I treat them differently. I I see them differently, right? I without wanting to, without but but. Um, it's a transformation of our representations mm -hmm. that has uh, profound consequences for how we act vis-a-vis -vis one another and how I think we all feel, as uh, this comment is, says, you know, that we are something lost because for everything I gain, you know, to be able to join you in this way now and live in the midst of a pandemic, there's, I, I, we lose, we lose a lot too. Uh, what is it? Why does it matter? <laughs> Thank goodness, I think it matters. Thank goodness, there's something more. As Claudia says, like as, as students realize, there's something more beyond the calculable. But um, why does it so much matter? And uh, what changes to how we, to what we can do, and the kind of actions we can take, and uh, when we lose that contact? Yeah. 
I mean, to flip that another way, there's uh, certainly a sense that we've all had watching the representations, the digital representations coming from the front in Ukraine and from the government in Ukraine, this insistence on their dignity and on, on, on it being visible to the world that I think is really quite extraordinary and not like anything we've seen really. So um, I think that that's worth saying as well. I mean, I'm sure all of you are as as obsessed with that as as I am, you know, at this moment. Yeah. Let me and actually, read some, some yeah. quick, quick, quick comment there that um, incidentally, and I want to, I want to understand the history of this actually why, but the 2014 moment of revolution in Ukraine was is known as the dignity revolution. Mm. Uh, and again, it has nothing to do with technology at that moment, but yeah. it, 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 it names, you know, the, the recognition and the potential components, you know, to be who we want to be. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that that, um, that kind of representation and, and search for recognition and, and sharing and empathy that we see with social media is, is really an un un unprecedented. Um, even between, we never think about the previous wars that uh, recently that have been fought in part over Twitter. This is something, this is of a different scale. Yeah. Um, I want to, uh, maybe it's a countering of such inhumanity with such humanity, who knows, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, without the digital, it would not be possible. Those representations would not be possible. Yeah. Jackson's question here, very good one, perhaps one on which to end. Regarding your comment on the ability of AI to better calculate people with an acceptable margin of error, does that mean online presence of a person becomes a separate identity that can be easily calculable compared to their real life self? Hmm. <clears throat> um. In that question, I, I, I don't think what that question makes me think about, and please, uh, Jackson, feel free to uh, explain more what you mean. But it makes me feel, think about the, the question of whether um, the relationship between the representations of the self uh, and, and a real uh, life self. Um, you know, there's so much this literature and discussion about uh, the, the significance of virtual versus real. And I really, just like we're talking about uh, the inability to say, uh, you know, uh, what is human, you know, what, whether we lose humanity or we gain a new form of humanity. I think similarly here, we, we can no longer think of a self, a real life self without the represented, calculable, calculated self and all of its different proliferations um, from the images to the statements, to the numbers, you know, to the risk scores that are, are out there about us. So I would try to always um, kind of collapse that distance. Um, a separate, I don't think it's a separate identity. I think it's layered, it's layered onto who we are and it's just a, you know, it's a transformation, but I'd be really, Curious to hear Jackson kind of where your question is coming from, if you care to, to voice, um, give it voice. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting question because um, as someone that kind of grew up with technology through, I, I, the iPhone came out when I was six. So I've always had, like, I mean, I've always lived on the internet and it's in one way or another. And uh, knowing a lot of my friends when they're on the internet, definitely they act different, they'll voice different opinions. And I think you're absolutely right. It's not like a separate, it's, it's not a separate, but it's like a layered identity. How do you act in relation to one social group and how do you react, act in real life and the internet? So I think that was yeah. a really interesting way of, that I, I always consider it like a separate identity, not like a layered identity. Interesting, interesting. But, so it could be really use, useful and strategic to have it as a separate. You know, it makes me think of kind of the way that I myself experience um, kind of knowing multiple languages. And like when I speak Russian to my mom, you know, I'm a different person because I'm speaking that other language and because of the person I'm addressing. And, you know, when I write an email in French, I'm like, to, so I think we're as, as it's part of our human condition to always operate with these multiple masks. Multiple identities. And um, it's probably, you know, the, the, the digital kind of affords many more of these masks. No wonder there's such a kind of taking to avatars and the development and curation of avatars because these are our ex 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 extensions. But then what I guess what we have to rewrite is the, the, the kind of the idea that there is a self, an authentic original self 
right? That maybe we are just these composites, you know, we are just these these hybrids. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Well, I think, it, I, I think the idea that there's, an, there's one sort of dominating fixed essence of self has gone by the by a long time ago. <laughs> but it yeah. keeps reasserting itself, right? It keeps saying, said like, oh, we're losing that or we're, we're losing, I don't know if we're losing or gaining. And maybe, maybe we'll, that's another thing of the human condition. We always have to talk about what we lose and what we gain. You know, we can't, um, that's our way of dealing with change. I don't know. <laughs> But thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jackson. That's a crucial point, kind of the multiplicity of that and, and it's how it can be played. And thank you, Jackson. And thank you, you, Claudia. But most of all, thank you so much, Margot, because this really was an extraordinary lecture. And I, I thank you for the, the 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 layers and layers that you set on on there and the vastness of your reflections, but at the same time, it was extremely orderly and easy to follow. And I think really important for the students who took part in it today, our board chair was on earlier, some former trustees were on earlier as well. And we thank you really for being, being part of this. What you taught me is how far back this goes. I mean, I have assumed that this was all part of it, that this stuff all started to happen in the, in the ubiquitous computer part, but your <laughs> examples from World War II were re remarkable. You know, and, and the way that some human beings, even the ones who made them, were able to resist their misuse um, at the same time. Thank you so much. And um, we look forward to hosting you and having you at AUP as much as possible until you move to Zurich. <laughs> Thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity, Claudia and Susan as well, and everybody on the call. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.